Start hour 19, page 590. Making family sustaining work accessible. Our national work ethic is an American hallmark. As Benjamin Franklin once said, America is the land of labor. Much of American life is mediated by Americans coming together to take responsibility for solving problems and helping their communities. Our labor agenda must allow community institutions, including small businesses, schools, and universities, religious organizations, and worker organizations, to thrive. Protect flexible work options and worker independence, independent contractors. Roughly 60 million Americans across all income groups, ages, education levels, races, and household types participate in independent work, including full-time, part-time, or as a side hustle. People choose independent work for a variety of reasons, including flexibility, earnings potential, and the desire to be one's own boss. An economic analysis of data from 1 million Uber drivers found that they valued the flexibility of the platform at 40% of their earnings, and the average Uber driver would not work at all if he or she had to submit to a taxi cab schedule. The value of flexibility extends beyond ride-sharing and other platform work, more than half of people who did independent work in 2021 said they cannot work a traditional job because of personal or family circumstances such as their health or caring for a child or family member. Independent workers, or contractors, are also critical to entrepreneurship and small business growth and success. On average, employers with four or fewer employees rely on seven contractors to run their business. Without the ability to hire those contractors, many small businesses could not compete with larger ones that can afford to employ workers in-house. Businesses and workers currently must navigate many different definitions of who is and who is not an employee, or an independent contractor, based on federal and state employment, compensation, tort, tax, and pension laws. This complexity often leads to confusion, improper classification, and costly litigation. The Trump administration finalized rules to provide clarity on which workers qualify as an independent contractor or employee under the FLSA and NLRA. The Biden administration is replacing those rules with vague and expansive definitions that would add uncertainty, increase costs, and reduce options for Americans who want to work independently. NLRB and Dole should return to their 2019 and 2021 independent contractor rules that provided much needed clarity for workers and employers. Congress should establish a bright line test based on the level of control an individual exercises over his or her work to determine whether a payee is an employee or an independent contractor, across all relevant laws. This would prevent continued uncertainty as well as provide continuity across federal laws. Congress should provide a safe harbor from employer-employee status for companies that offer independent workers access to earned benefits. Doing so would increase access among independent contractors to traditional pooled workplace benefits such as health care and retirement savings accounts. Protect small businesses and entrepreneurship, joint employer. Millions of businesses across America engage in mutually beneficial affiliation arrangements with other businesses. These arrangements include janitorial services, staffing firms, construction contractors and subcontractors, technology support services, and many other vendor and contracting services. They also include the nearly 775,000 independently owned franchise businesses, which employ 8.2 million workers across the United States. The franchise structure offers a proven business model for individuals who want to own and operate their own small business. An Obama-era regulation changed the definition of a joint employer to make corporate franchisers jointly liable for employees of individual franchisee owners, even without the franchisor exercising any direct control over those employees. The Biden administration is advancing an even more expansive definition of a joint employer that would upend the franchise business model, taking away ownership and income opportunities from small business entrepreneurs, costing jobs, and raising prices. Dole and NLRB should return to the long-standing approach to defining joint employers based on direct and immediate control. Congress should enact the Save Local Business Act, which would codify the long-standing definition that has existed outside the Obama era and Biden proposed rules. Overtime Pay Threshold Overtime pay is one of the most challenging aspects of the Fair Labor Standards Act rules. Non-exempt workers, example workers whose job duties fall within the law's power or whose total pay is low enough, must be paid overtime, 150% of the regular rate, for every hour over 40 in a work week. Overtime requirements may discourage employers from offering certain fringe benefits such as reimbursement for education, child care, or even free meals because the benefits value may be included in the regular rate that must be paid at 150% for all overtime hours. And because some of these fringe benefits may be more valuable, and often come with tax preferences that benefit the worker, the goal should be to set a threshold to ensure lower income workers have the protections of overtime pay without discouraging employers from offering these benefits. Dole should maintain an overtime threshold that does not punish businesses in lower cost regions, example the Southeast United States. The Trump era threshold is high enough to capture most line workers in lower cost regions. One possibility to consider, likely requiring congressional action, would be to automatically update the thresholds every five years using the Personal Consumption Expenditures, PCE, as an inflation adjustment. 
This could reduce the likelihood of a future administration attempting to make significant changes but would also impose more adjustments on businesses as those automatic increases take hold. Congress should clarify that the regular rate for overtime pay is based on the salary paid rather than all benefits provided. This would enable employers to offer additional benefits to employees without fear that those benefits would dramatically increase overtime pay. Congress should provide flexibility to employers and employees to calculate the overtime period over a longer number of weeks. Specifically, employers and employees should be able to set a two- or four-week period over which to calculate overtime. This would give workers greater flexibility to work more hours in one week and fewer hours in the next and would not require the employer to pay them more for that same total number of hours of work during the entire period. Compliance Assistance Programming Labor agencies are often tempted to encourage overcompliance by companies subject to regulation by pursuing regulation through enforcement strategies. Rather than giving regulated entities clear boundaries for what they can and cannot do under the law, the agencies rely on the vagueness of the law to bring enforcement activity against businesses that fail to meet an inspector or agency head's personal standard. This is not fair to regulated parties and results in disfavored companies bearing the brunt of the agency's enforcement efforts even though their behavior may be within the mainstream of employer behavior. Labor agencies should provide compliance assistance to help businesses and workers better understand the agency's position on their own rules and should do so in a way that makes it easier to follow those rules. This frees people to focus on their work rather than slogging through an ever-growing body of laws, rules, and guidance documents generated by the agencies. Clear and restrictive rules on guidance documents. Federal agencies not only issue regulations to fill in gaps left by legislation, but also supplement those regulations with guidance documents that occupy a unique and often confusing area between law and helpful advice. Unfortunately, wielded by overzealous enforcement agents, such guidance, some of it even hidden from public view, morphs into binding law used against unsuspecting employers. Guidance can be a tricky thing and can be used for good or bad. It should be used to make complicated regulations easier to understand, so that businesses can do their actual jobs and focus on providing jobs to American workers and value to consumers, really, compliance assistance. But guidance is often used to create new rules overnight without following legal requirements like giving the public an opportunity to provide valuable input. This wrongful use of guidance hurts workers and those who employ them. In October 2019, President Trump signed an executive order ending this abusive practice and created a new, fairer system for American businesses and their employees. In response, Dole published its pro-good guidance rule, which expressly limits its use of guidance in enforcement actions and gives the public the opportunity to submit comments to influence the department's decisions on creating, revising, and even rescinding guidance. Under this rule, Agencies cannot treat guidance as legally binding and must make all guidance documents readily accessible on their searchable online databases. This rule was immediately rescinded by the Biden administration. Dole should reinstitute the pro-good guidance rule via notice and comment. Congress should amend the Administrative Procedure Act to explicitly limit the use of guidance documents. Exemptions from regulations for small business. Burdensome regulations have anti-competitive effects. In general, larger, Higher margin businesses are better able to absorb the costs of regulatory compliance than are small businesses, and under the Biden administration, big business lobbies have affirmatively embraced certain regulations, such as the COVID vaccine mandate for private employers, to reduce competition from smaller businesses. Research suggests that labor regulations may pose the highest aggregate regulatory cost for small businesses. The labor agencies should exercise their available discretion and duties under the Regulatory Flexibility Act to exempt small entities from regulations where possible. Congress should enact legislation increasing the revenue thresholds at which the National Labor Relations Board asserts jurisdiction over employers to match changes in inflation that have occurred since 1935 and better reflect the definition of small business used by the federal government. Congress, and Dole, in its enforcement discretion, should exempt small business, first-time, non-willful violators from fines issued by the Occupational Health and Safety Administration. Education and Vocational Training Apprenticeships the next administration should return to prior policy and implement an industry-recognized apprenticeship program separate from the Registered Apprenticeship Program, RAP, and explore how best to modernize, streamline, and eliminate duplication in the RAP. For roughly 80 years, the RAP which requires conforming to government standards and includes federal funding, tax credits, and other federal resources has dominated apprenticeship programs in the U.S. Organizations across the political spectrum have noted that the overly burdensome requirements of RAPs have contributed to limiting them to legacy trades, failing to meet growing industry demands such as in healthcare and technology. A 2017 study estimated that the number of occupations commonly filled through apprenticeships could nearly triple, from 27 to 74, that the number of job openings filled through apprenticeships could expand eightfold, to 3.2 million, and that the occupations ripe for apprenticeship expansion could offer 20% higher wages than traditional apprenticeship occupations. The Trump administration expanded apprenticeship options through the creation of the Industry Recognized Apprenticeship Program, IRAP, and more than 130 IRAPs were created. 
the Biden administration rescinded the IRAP regulations. Congress should expand apprenticeship programs outside of the RAP model, recreating the IRAP system by statute and allowing approved entities such as trade associations and educational institutions to recognize and oversee apprenticeship programs. In addition, religious organizations should be encouraged to participate in apprenticeship programs. America has a long history of religious organizations working to advance the dignity of workers and provide them with greater opportunity, from the many prominent Christian and Jewish voices in the early labor movement to the labor priests who would appear on picket lines to support their flocks. Today, the role of religion in helping workers has diminished, but a country committed to strengthening civil society must ask more from religious organizations and make sure that their important role is not impeded by regulatory roadblocks or the bureaucratic status quo. Encourage and enable religious organizations to participate in apprenticeship programs, etc. Both Dole and NLRB should facilitate religious organizations helping to strengthen working families via apprenticeship programs, worker organizations, vocational training, benefits networks, etc. Hazard order regulations. Some young adults show an interest in inherently dangerous jobs. Current rules forbid many young people, even if their family is running the business, from working in such jobs. This results in worker shortages in dangerous fields and often discourages otherwise interested young workers from trying the more dangerous job. With parental consent and proper training, certain young adults should be allowed to learn and work in more dangerous occupations. This would give a green light to training programs and build skills in teenagers who may want to work in these fields. Dole should amend its hazard order regulations to permit teenage workers access to work in regulated jobs with proper training and parental consent. Workforce Training Grant Program The federal government spends more than $100 billion per year subsidizing higher education but close to zero supporting people on non-college pathways. Congress should create an employer grant worth up to $10,000 per year or prorated portion thereof for each worker engaged in on-the-job training, defined as some share of paid time spent in a formal training program. To qualify, a program whether run by the employer, an industry consortium, a community college, or a union would need to define program length, curriculum, career path, and credential and to report regularly on outcomes for participants. Programs that fail to deliver promised results would be disqualified from continued funding. Funding for employer grants should come from existing higher education subsidies that are currently disadvantaging alternative education options. Federal BA Box The American labor market continues to experience a glut of college degrees. The country produces more college graduates than suitable jobs for them to fill. Meanwhile, employers exacerbate the problem, fueling demand for college by needlessly requiring degrees for many jobs. In 2020, the Trump administration took an important step toward pro-worker, skills-based hiring practices. Executive Order 13932, Modernizing and Reforming the Assessment and Hiring of Federal Job Candidates, directed the Office of Personnel Management to reduce degree-based practices in the federal civil service. Maryland's Governor Larry Hogan issued an executive order in 2022 to adopt this rule for Maryland state employees, and Utah's Governor Spencer Cox in December of 2022 announced that Utah would do the same. Today, federal civil service job descriptions must be based on the specific skills and competencies required to perform those jobs, and may prescribe a minimum educational requirement only if it is otherwise legally required. The same policies do not extend beyond the civil service. Federal agencies continue to require college degrees for contract employees, and federal contractors are rarely able to place workers without four-year degrees on federal projects, regardless of their qualifications. Private employers consistently impose a BA requirement on jobs even when existing workers in the role do not have one. Adopt the civil services skills-based hiring standards for federal contractors. The president should direct the administrator for federal procurement policy to adopt the civil services skills-based hiring standards for federal contractors and issue waivers from degree-based staffing requirements in existing contracts. Prohibit the use of a BA requirement in job descriptions. Congress should prohibit the inclusion of a BA requirement in job descriptions for all private sector employers, or the use of a BA requirement to screen applicants using algorithms, except where a BA from a particular type of institution or in a particular field is a bona fide requirement of the position. Alternative view. While the federal government has a duty to promote economy and efficiency in federal hiring and contracting, and thus should base decisions on skills as opposed to degrees, it is not the federal government's role to determine whether private employers may or may not include degree requirements in job descriptions and in their hiring decisions. The inappropriate reverence given to degree requirements is a byproduct of the federal government's heavy subsidization of BA degrees. Phasing down federal subsidies would be a better way to eliminate barriers to jobs for individuals without BA degrees. Federal Workforce Development Programs Existing federally funded workforce development and training programs should be reassessed to ensure they are outcome-based and truly deliver value to taxpayers and job seekers. As of 2019, the federal government spent approximately $17 billion annually on 43 federal employment and training programs administered across nine federal agencies, many of which overlap with at least one other program. 
Many of these programs track only inputs or individuals served, not outcomes or outputs, and do not swiftly identify bad actor grantees. The federal government should identify underperforming programs and eliminate or redirect that funding to programs with strong outcome-based metrics. Evaluate and streamline workforce development programs, ensuring evidence-based outcomes. In its reauthorization of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, Congress should evaluate and streamline the existing workforce development programs to ensure there is no overlap or fragmentation between programs. Congress should also ensure strong evidence-based outcomes for each program and tie federal funding for those programs to the outcomes achieved. Review employment and training programs to ensure outcome-based metrics. Dole and other federal agencies with jurisdiction over employment and training programs should review their programs and utilize all available tools and authority to ensure these programs contain strong outcome-based metrics. To the extent that agencies have this authority, they should re-evaluate funding for programs that do not meet those evidence-based and outcomes-based requirements. Finally, strong internal policies should be implemented to ensure bad actor grantees are identified and sanctioned expeditiously. Federal Unemployment Insurance Program in the post-pandemic landscape, the federal government should restore the Unemployment Insurance UI, program's purpose with a particular focus on re-establishing program integrity and accountability. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security CARES, Act unemployment programs were defrauded of hundreds of billions of dollars, including by state-sponsored hacking groups. Not all state agencies are yet through their backlogs of appeals and fraud cases, the recovery of lost funds has been minimal, and fraud has now spilled into the traditional UI programs. The CARES Act era drastically altered the entire UI ecosystem, the federal, state partnership shifted toward federal programs and funding, and the social insurance purpose of the program was disconnected as benefits were extended, expanded to more typically uncovered populations, and made exponentially larger. Congress should enact bipartisan common-sense UI program reforms, including statutory authority for the Labor Office of Inspector General, OIG, to access all state UI records for the purposes of investigation and requiring state agencies to cross-match applicants with the National Directory of New Hires. Congress should also develop a framework, through commission of a congressional report to serve as a blueprint, of technical standards on broader tech topics like usability, state agency cybersecurity postures, data taxonomy standardization, and slash or identity verification standards. Congress should provide Dole with more reasonable enforcement tools for the UI system. Currently, Dole can either send a strongly worded letter or revoke the entire Federal Unemployment Tax Act, FUTA, tax credit, which would place an immediate 6% to 7% tax on all covered employers. Dole should review all actual or planned procurements against the $2 billion, under the American Rescue Plan Act, for UI fraud detection, accessibility, and equity investments. These funds do not have appropriations timelines and have very minimal statutory descriptions of the intended purpose. Dole should also review and propose changes to improve state monitoring programs including developing evidence-based frameworks for evaluating the technical readiness and security postures of the state agencies, strengthen its relationship with the OIG and Government Accountability Office, GAO, and support continued development of fraud prosecution with DOJ, the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, and the financial services community, ensure administrative and IT funding is outcome-based and gather and publish best practices from state officials, industry partners, and other vendors who deliver UI services. Worker Voice and Collective Bargaining Non-Union Worker Voice and Representation American workers lack a meaningful voice in today's workplace. Between 50% and 60% of workers have less influence than they want on critical workplaces issues beyond pay and benefits. Even managers are twice as likely to say their employees have too little influence rather than too much. But America's one-size-fits-all approach undermines worker representation. Federal labor law offers no alternatives to labor unions whose politicking and adversarial approach appeals to few, whereas most workers report that they prefer a more cooperative model run jointly with management that focuses solely on workplace issues. The next administration should make new options available to workers and push Congress to pass labor reforms that create non-union employee involvement organizations as well as a mechanism for worker representation on corporate boards. Congress should reintroduce and pass the Teamwork for Employees and Managers Team, Act of 2022. The Team Act, 1 reforms the National Labor Relations Acts, NLRA, Section 8, A, 2, Prohibition on Formal Worker, Management Cooperative Organizations like Works Councils. 2 creates an Employee Involvement Organization, EIO, to facilitate voluntary cooperation on critical issues like working conditions, benefits, and productivity. 3 amends labor law to allow EIOs at large, publicly traded corporations to elect a non-voting, supervisory member of their company's board of directors. Alternative View while some conservatives lament that workers lack sufficient voice in today's workplace, others interpret the rise in independent and flexible work opportunities, significant expansion in family-friendly policies like paid family leave, and the decline in private sector unionization as indicators of workers' increasing competency and control. 
Another way to help expand workers' freedom and voices in traditional workplaces is by allowing them to choose who represents them in negotiations with their employer. The Workers' Choice Act would accomplish this by ending exclusive representation so that unions in right-to-work states are no longer forced to represent workers who do not want to join them. Union Transparency Private sector unions must file detailed financial information with Dole on matters including union spending, income, loans, assets, membership information, and employee salary but unions composed entirely of state or local employees are exempt from this filing requirement. These disclosure requirements help workers and the public understand how union leaders are raising and spending union dues, they also can serve as a vital source of information that helps workers decide if the unions they are asked to join are good stewards of the funds they collect. Dole, under both George W. Bush and Donald Trump, tried rulemakings, known as the Intermediate Bodies Rule, that would require some government unions to file the same information that is required of private sector unions. Under President Trump, OLMS required unions to disclose involvement in trusts that they either own a majority stake in or control. In the past, union trust spending has been hidden, and it appears that trust assets have occasionally been corruptly spent for the benefit of private interests in union leadership such as $30,000 spent on a private party, $37,500 spent on a Mont Blanc pen, condominiums for those in power, golf outings, and a Ferrari. But the Biden dole eliminated a transparency rule requiring the filing of the T1 Trust Annual Report. More generally, OLMS, which is charged with enforcing the law of union disclosure, has historically been underfunded when compared to other dole agencies. This relative lack of funding has made ensuring disclosure more difficult. Enact transparency rules. The substance of the intermediate bodies rule should pass into law, either through rulemaking or through legislation. The T1 Trust Annual Report annual filing requirement should be restored. Increase funding levels. Congress should expand the funding of the Office of Labor Management Standards. Duty of Fair Representation. Unions have a duty of fair representation to their members, yet they too often abuse that duty to use their members' resources on left-wing culture war issues that are unrelated, and in fact often harmful, to union members' own interests. The NLRB should take enforcement or amicus action advancing the position that political conflicts of interest by union leadership can support claims for breach of the duty of fair representation in a manner analogous to financial conflicts of interest and analogous to breaches of the fiduciary duty of loyalty in other areas of law. Interpreting protected concerted activity. In an effort to prevent employers from retaliating against workers who express a desire to unionize, certain activities are deemed protected concerted activity, under 7 of the NLRA. The NLRB has issued extreme interpretations of these activities, such as determining that a business is requiring its employees to be courteous to customers and one another is an unlawful infringement on the free speech rights implicit in the protected concerted activity protections in the NLRA. Reverse unreasonable interpretations of protected concerted activity. The NLRB should return to the 2019 All-State Maintenance Interpretation of what does and does not constitute protected concerted activity, including listing eight instances of lawful actions by employers. Injunctive relief and worker organizing activities. Within the confines of the more reasonable definition of protected concerted activity described above, the NLRB should increase its pursuit of reinstatement injunctions. Firing workers engaged in concerted activity has an immediate chilling effect on organizing, but remedies under the NLRA typically come only much later and amount only to back pay. In NLRA Section 10, J, Congress empowered the NLRB to obtain temporary injunctions that immediately reinstate workers to their jobs in these circumstances. This provides a more meaningful remedy to the worker and creates a significant deterrent to unfair labor practices because prompt reinstatement will tend to reinforce the legitimacy of the organizing effort. The NLRB overwhelmingly prevails when pursuing an injunction, succeeding 100% of the time in 2020 and 91% of the time in 2021. Increase the use of 10, J, injunctive relief. The NLRB should increase its use of 10, J, and should articulate guidelines for situations in which it intends to seek injunctive relief, the board should delegate authority to pursue such injunctions to the general counsel and the general counsel should establish a policy of considering them expeditiously in all retaliation cases identified by regional offices. Dues-funded worker centers. Under current law, both labor unions and unionized employers must file financial disclosures with Dole on an annual basis to ward off potential fraud and corruption of the sort that has been seen recently within the United Automobile, Aerospace and Agricultural Implement Workers of America, UAW. However, worker centers, which have grown in number and influence enormously over the past decade, are not required to file these disclosures. Investigate worker centers and require financial disclosures. Dole should investigate worker centers that look and act like unions and bring enforcement actions to require them to file the same financial disclosures. Office of Labor Management Standards Initiative Currently, the Office of Labor Management Standards, OLMS, may investigate potential employer malfeasance with regard to union funds in the absence of any complaint by a worker or union but may not do the same with regard to potential union malfeasance. 
If OLMS has evidence that a union may be violating the law based on information available to the agency, such as annual financial disclosure reports, information developed during an audit of a union's books and records, or information obtained from other government agencies, it should be permitted to open an investigation. It should have the same enforcement tools available for both employers and unions. Revise investigation standards. The Office of Labor Management Standards should revise its investigation standards to authorize investigations without receiving a formal complaint. Persuader Rule During the Obama administration, Dole created significant regulatory burdens for employers with respect to the advice that employers receive about union activity. As a general matter, employers who hire lawyers or other consultants to advise employees about union issues must file disclosure forms with the department, as must the lawyers and consultants themselves. Prior to the Obama administration, advice provided solely to the employer required no disclosure. The Obama administration attempted to eliminate this advice exemption with a directive known as the Persuader Rule, which was successfully challenged in court. In 2018, the Trump administration formally rescinded the Persuader Rule. Dole should rescind the Persuader Rule once again should the Biden administration revive it. Unionizing the Workplace, Car Check vs. Secret Ballot Under the NLRA, instead of having a secret ballot election about the decision to unionize a workplace, a union may instead collect signed pro-union cards from a majority of the employees it wishes to represent and then ask the employer and National Labor Relations Board for voluntary union recognition. That request gives the employer the option to hold a secret ballot election or to recognize the union without any such election. This card check procedure is likely to induce employees to provide their signed cards in ways that do not accurately reflect their true preferences ranging from a desire not to offend the signature requester to a wish to avoid intimidation and coercion to signing based on false information provided by union organizers. In short, the car check procedure sidesteps many aspects of democratic decision-making that free and fair elections conducted by secret ballot are supposed to accomplish. Notably, the General Counsel of the National Labor Relations Board has recently proposed an esoteric legal theory that car check decision-making is required under the law, basing this theory on an old NLRB case, Joy Silk, even though the Supreme Court has repeatedly rejected mandatory car check recognition. Discard car check. Congress should discard car check as the basis of union recognition and mandate the secret ballot exclusively. Contract Bar Rule Although current labor law allows a union to establish itself at a workplace at more or less any time, the calendar for any attempt to decertify a union is considerably more constrained. If a union is recognized as a collective bargaining agent, then employees may not decertify it or substitute another union for it for at least one year under federal law, the certification bar. Similarly, when a union reaches a collective bargaining agreement with an employer, it is immune from a decertification election for up to three years, the contract bar. A typical consequence of these rules is that employees must often wait four years before they are allowed a chance at decertification. Employees then have only a 45-day window to file a decertification petition, if the employer and union sign a successor contract, then the contract bar comes into play once again meaning employees with an interest in decertification must wait another three years. Eliminate the contract bar rule. NLRB should eliminate the contract bar rule so that employees with an interest in decertification have a reasonable chance to achieve their goal. Tailoring National Employment Rules National employment laws like the Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, and the Occupational Safety and Health, OSH, Act set out one-size-fits-all floors regulating the employment relationship. These substantive worker protections often do not mesh well with the procedural worker protections offered through the NLRA's collective bargaining process. Unions could play a powerful role in tailoring national employment rules to the needs of a particular workplace if, in unionized workplaces, national rules were treated as negotiable defaults rather than non-negotiable floors. Congress should amend the NLRA to authorize collective bargaining to treat national employment laws and regulations as negotiable defaults. For example, this reform would allow a union to bless a relaxed overtime trigger, example 45 hours a week, or 80 hours over two weeks, in exchange for firm employer commitments on predictable scheduling. Alternative Policy While some conservatives, including the author of this chapter, believe that it would be a mistake to antagonize unions' core interests, Others argue that the next administration should end project labor agreement requirements and repeal the Davis-Bacon Act. And while some conservatives have chosen not to address massive federal subsidies for unionized labor, others believe that current laws and regulations that pick winners and losers to the detriment of the majority of construction workers and to all taxpayers should not be ignored. Project labor agreements, PLAS, are short-term collective bargaining agreements that apply to construction projects. There are a few reasons that construction projects may benefit from a PLA, and there are many reasons that even when actively encouraged to do so public construction projects have declined to use PLAS. Among the consequences, the majority of construction firms and construction workers are not unionized and their temporary forced unionization results in large-scale wage theft, construction companies are significantly less likely to bid on projects with PLAS, and PLAS consistently drive up construction costs by 10% to 30%. The Davis, 
Bacon Act requires federally financed construction projects to pay prevailing wages. In theory, these wages should reflect going market rates for construction labor in the relevant area. However, both the Government Accountability Office and the Department of Labor's Inspector General have repeatedly criticized the Labor Department for using self-selected, statistically unrepresentative samples to calculate the prevailing wage rates that drive up the cost of federal construction by about 10 percent. The Davis, Bacon Act redistributes wealth from hard-working Americans to those that benefit from government-funded construction projects. Repealing the Davis, Bacon Act would increase worker freedom and end a long-standing effective tax on American families. And PLA requirements. Agencies should end all mandatory project labor agreement requirements and base federal procurement decisions on the contractors that can deliver the best product at the lowest cost. Repeal Davis, Bacon. Congress should enact the Davis, Bacon Repeal Act and allow markets to determine market wages. The States. Worker-led benefits experimentation. Workers depend on unemployment benefits to navigate inevitable market frictions and seek new employment opportunities. But existing unemployment insurance, UI, is bureaucratic, ineffective, and unaccountable. The outdated system's myriad failures during the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the need for innovations that respond to recipients' needs. The most promising avenue for innovation is to involve workers and private sector organizations more directly, freed from unnecessary bureaucratic strictures. Americans take for granted that unemployment benefits must be administered by government agencies, but other Western market democracies feature effective and popular benefits administered by non-public worker organizations. The next conservative administration should encourage UI innovation by capitalizing on a key feature of the system and principle of conservative policy making, federalism. State governments already administer unemployment benefits and have broad discretion over their programs. Existing statutory language in the Social Security Act does not prohibit non-public organizations from administering the program, nor does it specifically authorize states to do so. Further, the administration can replicate state-level experiments in welfare programs and empower state officials to adapt UI to local conditions and needs. Approve non-public worker organizations as UI administrators. Dole should approve, pursuant to 303-A-2 of the Social Security Act, non-public worker organizations as administrators. Offer waivers for suitable alternatives. Dole should offer waivers from the standard requirements imposed on unemployment compensation by 303-A and 303-D of the Social Security Act to states that propose suitable alternatives. Require organizations to comply with restrictions on political spending. Dole should establish as a precondition for receiving any public funds a requirement that an organization comply with restrictions on political spending as applied to 501, c. 3, charitable organizations. Labor law. The federal laws governing labor management relations have barely changed in generations, and reforms on the federal level have been almost impossible to get through Congress. To modernize labor law, the Congress should pass legislation allowing waivers for states and local governments. To encourage experimentation and reform efforts at the state and local levels, Congress should pass legislation allowing waivers from federal labor laws like the NLRA and FLSA under certain conditions. State and local governments seeking waivers would be required to demonstrate that their reforms would accomplish the purpose of the underlying law, and not take away any current rights held by workers or employers. In addition, waivers would be limited to a five-year period, after which time they could be modified, cancelled, or renewed. Excessive Occupational Regulation Excessive occupational regulation most typically encountered as occupational licensing creates underemployment and wasted resources, and artificially increases consumer prices. It is a significant problem that is difficult to address at the federal level. Congress should ensure that interstate compacts for occupational license recognition that are federally funded do not require new or additional qualifications, that is, qualifications that do not originate from state governments themselves, for licensed professionals to participate. Congress should ensure that well-qualified licensees are not locked out of the job market by restrictive government programs funded by the federal government. For instance, medical doctors must complete residency training to practice, and because Medicare provides funding for significantly fewer residencies than there are doctors, sizable numbers of MDS are locked out of the job market every year. Wagner, Pazer Staffing Flexibility State agencies that administer unemployment benefits and workforce development programs should be able to hire the best people to do the job and should not be required to use state employees if a contractor can do the job better. Further, the federal government should not force a state to use non-union labor or union labor for these positions. Dole should repromulgate the Trump era staffing flexibility rule, and Congress should codify it. Worker Retirement Savings, ESG, and Pension Reforms Remove ESG considerations from ERISA. Environmental, Social, Governance, ESG, investing is a relatively recent strategy promoted by large asset managers that focuses not only on a company's bottom line, but also on the company's compliance with liberal political views on climate change, racial quotas, abortion, and other issues. The ESG movement has focused especially on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
For example, ESG proponents advocate for divestment from oil and gas companies or the exercise of investor influence to reduce oil and gas production. ESG considerations unrelated to investor risks and returns necessarily sacrifice trust laws traditional sole focus on investment returns for collateral interests. And while individual investors may prefer to invest in green companies, woke companies, or companies with greater board diversity, and may even be willing to sacrifice some financial gains to do so, the question relevant to Dole is whether, and under what conditions, fiduciaries should be permitted to follow this path as well. While Americans are free to invest their own savings however they wish, in ERISA, Congress imposed strict duties on employer-sponsored worker retirement plans as a prophylactic protection of workers' retirement security in general. Recognizing the unique status of employer-managed retirement savings, in ERISA, Congress required that fiduciaries exclusively seek the best interests of plan beneficiaries. Because ESG investing necessarily puts other considerations before the interests of the beneficiary, ESG investing by plan managers is an inappropriate strategy under ERISA. Dole should prohibit investing in ERISA plans on the basis of any factors that are unrelated to investor risks and returns. Dole should return to the Trump administration's approach of permitting only the consideration of pecuniary factors in ERISA. However, this approach should not preclude the consideration of legitimate non-ESG factors, such as corporate governance, supply chain investment in America, or family supporting jobs. Dole should consider taking enforcement and slash or regulatory action to subject investment in China to greater scrutiny under ERISA. Many large retirement and pension plans remain invested in China despite its lack of compliance with U.S. accounting standards and state control over all aspects of private capital. Alternative view. Some conservatives believe that ERISA plan investments should be made solely on a pecuniary basis and the consideration of any non-pecuniary factor, ESG, or otherwise, should be prohibited. Additionally, other conservatives believe that even though ESG investing is often not a sound financial strategy, it is not wrong for retirement plans to offer ESG investment options so long as individuals explicitly acknowledge and choose to pursue investment options that do not exclusively maximize pecuniary gains. Thrift Savings Plan The Thrift Savings Plan, TSP, is the retirement savings benefit plan for most federal employees and many former employees. The TSP is managed by the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board, FRITIB. At over $800 billion in assets under management, the TSP is one of the largest retirement plans in the world. Dole should reverse efforts to politicize the TSP by removing mutual fund windows that encourage ESG, and should clarify the fiduciary duties of the TSP. Recent efforts by Congressional Democrats and the Biden administration to politicize the TSP by offering selective mutual fund windows that encourage ESG should be reversed by Dole, and the fiduciary duties of the TSP should be clarified by the department to preclude ESG investments absent individual stock selection by the participant. The TSP is managed under contract by private sector fund managers. Its current managers are BlackRock and State Street Global Advisors. Both of these managers have demonstrated a public commitment to use the funds they manage to advance ESG. The federal government should follow the lead of multiple state governments in removing their pension funds from fund managers such as BlackRock and State Street Global Advisors, and contract with a competitive, private sector manager that will comply with its fiduciary duties. Dole should also consider bringing enforcement actions against BlackRock and State Street Global Advisors for their violations of fiduciary duty while managing the TSP. Congress should enact legislation authorizing the FRITIB to exercise its independent business judgment in exercising the proxy votes for its holdings of the TSP and provide clear proxy voting guidelines for the FRITIB to follow. The current proxy advisor market is dominated by two firms, Institutional Shareholder Services and Glass-Lewis, which use heavily weighted ESG criteria in directing the proxy votes of pension plans. If feasible, the new legislation should also offer a streamlined process for other proxy advisors to compete for the teaspoons business. As the principal retirement savings plan of America's servicemen and women, part of the FRITIB's fiduciary duties in managing the TSP is a duty not to invest in governments that are enemies of the United States. Yet the FRITIB has repeatedly approved the investment of TSP funds in Chinese military companies and state-owned enterprises. Under the Trump administration, Dole ordered the FRITIB to cease investments in China. However, under the Biden administration, the TSP has made available a wide range of investments in China. Dole should exercise its oversight of the FRITIB to prohibit investments in China. Congress should enact legislation prohibiting investment of the TSP in China. Pension Reforms Public Pension Plan Disclosure Residents of states that responsibly manage their public pension plans, pension plans for state and local government employees, should not be responsible for bailing out states that do not do so. Money is ultimately fungible, so federal aid to states can effectively be used to free up other state funds for pension contributions. Although the federal government does not impose funding rules on public pension plans, these plans should be required to disclose the fair market value of plan assets and liabilities, using the Treasury yield curve as the discount rate, on an annual basis. In the aggregate, these plans were underfunded on a market basis by $6.501 trillion as of fiscal year, FI, 2021, 
even though the plans reported underfunding of only $1.076 trillion using overly optimistic assumptions. Disclose the fair market value of plan assets and liabilities. Congress should require public pension funds to disclose the fair market value of plan assets and liabilities, using the Treasury yield curve as the discount rate, on an annual basis. Multi-employer plans. At the request of multi-employer union pension plans, the government has given such plans much more lenient rules and discretion over funding than it has given to single-employer plans. Multi-employer plans have been severely mismanaged, and the plans have abused the discretion and deference given them by federal law and enforcement agencies to make promises that they cannot keep. As a result, these plans are generally severely underfunded, with $757 billion in aggregate underfunding, and a funding level of just 42%. The Biden administration has provided a massive taxpayer bailout to some of these plans, but without any needed reforms. Even worse, it gave out funds in excess of what the law allows. Congress should reform multi-employer pensions to give participants in these plans the same protections as those in single-employer plans. Liabilities should be measured similarly to single-employer plans. Workers should be able to earn benefits at any employer in the plan, but liabilities should be divided amongst employers, instead of the current illusory joint and several liability under which no one is ultimately responsible for making up underfunding. Troubled plans should be prohibited from making new pension promises. More timely and detailed reporting should be imposed. Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, PBGC, ensures benefits for private sector pension plans, with separate single-employer and multi-employer insurance programs. The PBGC's annual report must be submitted on time, and with timely data that uses fair market value principles to calculate the PBGC's finances. The PBGC has been submitting portions of statutorily required annual reports many months late and using out-of-date data. And PBGC's data on plans is almost five years old. These problematic practices make it difficult for Congress to become aware of serious problems in the insurance programs, which received a bailout of over $85 billion in the 2021 American Rescue Plan Act. The PBGC should use existing statutory authority to protect workers, retirees, employers, and taxpayers by closely monitoring and taking appropriate remedial action with regard to badly run and underfunded multi-employer union pension plans, including termination where appropriate. The PBGC's refusal to use such authority helped cause its multi-employer program deficit to go from less than $500 million in 2008 to over $65 billion in 2017. Congress should increase the variable rate premium on underfunding and eliminate the per-participant cap in order to appropriately take into account risk and limit the degree to which well-funded pension plans must subsidize underfunded plans. Reforms should proportionately reduce the fixed per-participant premium to ease the burden on well-funded plans and also increase premiums on multi-employer plans to match single-employer plans. Improving access to employee stock ownership plans. Employee stock ownership plans, ESOPs, are ERISA-covered employee retirement savings plans that allow employees to receive compensation in the form of equity in their employer business. These arrangements enable employees to formally participate as investors in how their employer's businesses are run. And they also align employer-employee incentives by giving employees a greater financial stake in the success of their employers. With over half of small businesses owned by business owners over the age of 55, ESOPs also create advantageous succession opportunities that support the continuity of local businesses and regional economic development. Finally. ESOPs can enable greater investment returns for employees. However, ESOPs have to date lacked clear rules under ERISA that recognize their unique structure and benefits, and this opacity can serve as a barrier to employers considering adopting ESOPs. Provide clear regulations for ESOP valuation and fiduciary conduct. Dole should make it easier for employers to offer ESOPs by providing clear regulations for ESOP valuation and fiduciary conduct that encourages the participation of employee beneficiaries in corporate governance, while recognizing the importance of financial diversification for retirement security. Alternative view. Conservatives believe that it is important for American families to have control over their savings and to be able to hold diversified assets. While ESOPs can be a beneficial part of a worker's and family's savings, some conservatives believe that the government should not favor one form of investment over another or make it harder for families to have a diversified investment portfolio. Putting American Workers First A labor agenda focused on the strength of American families must put American workers first. As the family necessarily puts the interests of its members first, so too the United States must put the interests of American workers first. Immigration The H-2A visa, meant to allow temporary agricultural workers into the United States, also suffers frequent employer abuse. The low cost of H-2A workers undercuts American workers in agricultural employment. The H-2A program is not subject to any statutory numerical cap and has been expanding in recent years, surpassing 200,000 visa issuances for the first time in 2019. Cap and phase down the H-2A visa program. 
Congress should immediately cap this program at its current levels and establish a schedule for its gradual and predictable phase down over the subsequent 10 to 20 years, producing the necessary incentives for the industry to invest in raising productivity, including through capital investment in agricultural equipment, and increasing employment for Americans in the agricultural sector. Encourage the establishment of an industry consortium and match funding. Congress should also encourage the establishment of an industry consortium of agricultural equipment producers and other automation and robotics firms interested in entering the sector and match funding invested by the industry, with intellectual property developed within the consortium freely available to all participants. Alternative view. Some conservatives believe that temporary worker programs help to fill jobs that Americans will not fill, prevent illegal immigration by giving farmers and others who hire low-skilled labor access to workers, and keep down the prices of food and other products and services produced by the temporary workers. Some credibly argue that, absent the H-2A program, many farmers would have to drastically increase wages, raising the price of food for all Americans, and that even such wage increases may not be sufficient to attract enough temporary American workers to complete the necessary farm tasks to get food products to market since those jobs are, by their nature, seasonal. Those who share this view argue that any plan to phase out the program should weigh the program's current costs, relatively low, and the program's current benefits, makes American farming more profitable and sustainable while keeping down food costs. Phase out the H-2B visa program. The H-2B visa, for non-agricultural seasonal workers, suffers from many of the same harms and abuses as H-2A, albeit of lesser scope because of its cap and distribution across many sectors. Congress should immediately cap this program at its current levels and establish a schedule for its gradual and predictable phase down over no more than 10 years. Alternative view. As with the H-2A program, some conservatives see the H-2B program as a valuable program that provides low-cost temporary workers in jobs that American companies, by and large, cannot find enough American workers to fill, example tourists season child care providers at ski resorts, swimming instructors at summer camps, housekeepers and groundskeepers at amusement parks, and extra summer cooks at restaurants that serve national park patrons, these seasonal jobs are less desirable to Americans who predominantly prefer year-round work. Labor shortages after the pandemic support this belief. Absent the H-2B program, many of these seasonal businesses would be forced to cut their hours or even close altogether. Any plan to phase out the program should weigh the program's current costs, relatively low, and the program's current benefits, make seasonal business more feasible. Higher American requirements. When government purchases goods or services, if at all possible, not only should the company be an American company and the products be manufactured in America, but the companies should also be encouraged to hire American workers. Likewise, private employers should be free to prefer our own countrymen. Congress should mandate that all new federal contracts require at least 70% of the contractor's employees to be U.S. citizens, with the percentage increasing to at least 95% over a 10-year period. Congress must amend the law so that employers can again have the freedom to make hiring Americans a priority. Despite the significant advantages that preferring citizens over, work authorized, aliens in hiring would provide to American workers, businesses, and the country at large, such a practice has been illegal since 1986. This makes no sense. Alternative view Some conservatives believe that the government has a duty to limit its spending in order to limit how much it takes from American families. This means that when the government spends money, it must find the most economical and effective way to do so. Excessive government spending will be borne by American workers and families through reduced incomes and purchasing power. There may be good reasons to require a certain percentage of American workers on federal contracts, but those decisions should be based on economy and efficiency as opposed to arbitrary quotas. Visa fraud. American businesses that commit visa fraud and hire illegal immigrants should not be the beneficiaries of federal spending. But a 2020 report by the Department of Labor's Office of Inspector General, OIG, examined the department's process for excluding employers who commit visa fraud and abuse from federal contracts and found much to be desired. To protect the American workforce from unscrupulous immigration lawyers, employers, and labor brokers, the department must follow the recommendations of the OIG and institute more robust investigations for suspected visa fraud and speedier debarments for those found guilty. International Labor Policy Leveling the International Playing Field for Workers As recent decades of intense import competition and offshoring have made clear, American workers suffer when the U.S. opens its markets to foreign nations' minimal labor standards and exploitative conditions. While federal law already prohibits the importation of goods produced with forced labor, the prohibitions are toothless without effective means of enforcement and cover only the most basic of workers' rights. The Trump administration and its United States Trade Representative, USTR, took unprecedented steps to redress the issue for workers. The U.S., Mexico, Canada Agreement, UZMCA, contain the strongest and most far-reaching labor provisions of any free trade agreement, FTA, with protections and commitments to reduce labor abuses and raise wages. It also established new modes of enforcement. For future FTAs, the USTR should replicate the labor provisions of UZMCA, 
especially the provisions to eliminate all forms of forced or compulsory labor. Protect workers' rights to organize and participate voluntarily in a union without employer interference or discrimination. Create a rapid response mechanism to provide for an independent panel investigation of denial of labor rights at covered facilities. Shift the burden of proof by presuming that an alleged violation affects trade and investment, unless otherwise demonstrated. For future authorizations of Trade Promotion Authority, TPA, the President should urge Congress to create mechanisms for supply chain transparency. Institute a general prohibition on forced labor conditions. Investigate foreign labor violations that undermine American workers. The United States' embrace of globalization has exposed American workers to unfair competition from nations with cheap, abundant, and often exploited labor. American workers have, as a consequence, seen their earning power erode. While negotiating stronger trade agreements with robust labor provisions should be the primary tool with which to regulate international labor competition, the federal government can also take steps to identify the worst labor abuses and rule breakers. Dole's Bureau of International Labor Affairs, ILAB, plays a critical role in monitoring and enforcing the labor provisions of U.S. trade agreements and trade preference programs as well as investigating child labor and human trafficking violations. The next administration should focus ILAB investigations on foreign labor violations that do the most to damage American workers' earning power, specifically regimes that engage in child and forced labor, fail to protect workers' organizing rights, and permit hazardous or otherwise exploitative working conditions. Alternative slash additional view. Conservatives share a belief in protecting and promoting American workers and their families and orienting international policies with Americans' interests first. Some conservatives believe that the best way to put America first is by making America more attractive. In addition to restrictions imposed on other countries, removing existing barriers to American manufacturing, employment, and commerce can help American workers, entrepreneurs, and families. Organizational Agenda Budget, reduce the agency's budgets to the low end of the historical average. The Trump administration's FI 2020 request, $10.9 billion, would provide a workable target for spending reductions for Dole, for example. Spending reductions should occur primarily in the Employment and Training Administration, EDA. Focus health and safety inspections on egregious offenders, as other inspections are often abused and usurp state and local government prerogatives. Personnel, maximize hiring of political appointees. At its best, the Trump administration Department of Labor worked with up to 150 political appointees. That is still a tiny percentage of the department. The number of political appointees should be maximized in order to improve the political accountability of the department. Appoint new EEOC and NLRB general counsels on day one. The Biden administration broke significant precedent by firing the EEOC and NLRB general counsels despite their term appointments. The next administration should do the same and expand on the Biden administration's new precedent by refusing to acknowledge terms in other offices, where applicable, and installing acting or full new officers immediately. Implement a hiring freeze for career officials. A hiring freeze imposes financial discipline on agency's personnel costs and reduces agency bloat. Office of Compliance Initiatives, Dole should fully staff the Office of Compliance Initiatives, OC, which was reopened by the Trump administration after the Obama administration closed its predecessor down. OC educates employers and workers on their rights, responsibilities, and available recourse under the many statutes, rules, and regulations administered by Dole. Most businesses want to follow the law and OC exists to make knowing the rules easier, which leads to increased compliance. Improved visa-related labor market monitoring Dole's Office of Foreign Labor Certification plays an important role in the approval of H-Visa applications, but it is currently housed in the Employment and Training Administration, which is Dole's primary grant-making division. OFLC should be moved out of EDA and made directly accountable to the secretary with a politically accountable director. Conclusion The good of the American family is at the heart of conservative labor policy recommendations. The long-standing tradition of a strong work ethic in American culture must be encouraged and strengthened by policies that promote family-sustaining jobs. By eliminating the policies promoted by the DEI agenda, promoting pro-life policies that support family life, expanding available apprenticeship programs including by encouraging the role of religious organizations in apprenticeships, making family-sustaining jobs accessible, simplifying employment requirements, and allowing employers to prefer American citizens when making hiring decisions, among the other policy recommendations discussed above, we can begin to secure a future in which the American worker, and by extension the American family, can thrive and prosper. Chapter 19 Page 619 Department of Transportation, Introduction America needs transportation that is more abundant and affordable as well as dignified, accessible, and family-friendly. Transportation plays a vital role in the prosperity and flourishing of the United States. Americans use trucks, tankers, and trains to keep our supply chains running and cars, transit, and planes to go where we want to go. 240 years ago, 
Adam Smith recognized that connections were a bedrock of society because they stimulate specialization, innovation, and capital investment. In the following decades, America's growth was made possible by transportation first ports and transatlantic shipping, then roads, canals, and eventually railroads pushing westward to create the nation we call home. Access to transportation is part of what made our country great. The U.S. Department of Transportation, DOT, with the requested fiscal year, FI, 2023 budget of $142 billion, was originally intended simply to provide a policy framework for transportation safety, rulemaking, and regulation. However, it has evolved to believe that its role is to deliver the world's leading transportation system that is, to select individual projects and allocate taxpayer funds in the actual planning, developing, and building of transportation assets. Such a role is held more appropriately by transportation asset owners, primarily states, municipalities, and the private sector. In addition to providing a safety and regulatory framework through its 11 subcomponents, known as modes, the department has become a de facto grant-making and lending organization. DOT provides approximately $50 billion in discretionary and formula grants, known as obligations, annually in areas ranging from transit systems to road construction to universities and has lent or subsidized more than $60 billion since the Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, TIFIA, program. Now managed by the Build America Bureau, was created in 1998. This evolved role as a major, and often primary, funding and financing source is far from the department's original policy framework. It also removes incentives for state and local officials to ensure that investments are worthwhile, because federal money removes the need to get public buy-in to build and maintain infrastructure projects as funding becomes someone else's money. Despite the department's tremendous resources, congressional mandates, and funding priorities have made it difficult for DOT to focus on the pressing transportation challenges that most directly affect average Americans, such as the high cost of personal automobiles, especially in an era of high inflation, unpredictable and expensive commercial shipping by rail, air, and sea, and infrastructure spending that does not match the types of transportation that most Americans prefer. Transforming the department to address the varied needs of all Americans more effectively remains a central challenge. DOT is particularly difficult to manage because its 11 major components nine modal administrations, the Office of the Secretary, and the Office of the Inspector General all have their own sets of personnel including administrators, deputy administrators, chiefs of staff, and general counsels. Most grants flow through the modes, such as the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, and Federal Aviation Administration. The Office of the Secretary contains its own grant-making operation that funds research and some special grants, as well as a major lending operation, the Build America Bureau, that functions as an infrastructure bank. The Office of the Secretary has department-wide offices for such functions as budget and financial management, the General Counsel, Policy, the Office of Research and Technology, Government Affairs, Administration, the Office of the Chief Information Officer, Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, Public Affairs, Drug and Alcohol Policy and Compliance, and Civil Rights. The modal administrations include the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, Federal Railroad Administration, FRA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, Federal Transit Administration, FTA, Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, GLS, Maritime Administration, MRAD, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, FMSA, and Pipeline Safety and Hazardous Material Administration, FMSA. DOT's fundamental problem is that instead of being able to focus on providing Americans with affordable and abundant transportation, it has become saddled with congressional requirements that reduce the department to a de facto grant-making organization. Yet there is little need for much of this grant-making, for two reasons, new technology enables private companies to charge for transportation in many areas, which could transform how innovation is financed. It is vital to consider the role of user fees and other pricing innovations with regard to transportation infrastructure. Airport landing fees for aircraft, toll charges on roads and bridges, and per gallon taxes on gasoline and diesel fuel are all examples of user charges that affect the decisions of transportation system users. These changes could shift our nation's transportation away from being a top, down system that is misaligned with the needs of so many Americans. Increasing private sector financing could revolutionize travel and increase everyday mobility to its greatest potential in a way that Americans prefer. Doing so would keep transportation decisions out of the hands of bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., who are far removed from local problems and preferences. If funding must be federal, it would be more efficient for the U.S. Congress to send transportation grants to each of the 50 states and allow each state to purchase the transportation services that it thinks are best. Such an approach would enable states to prioritize different types of transportation according to the needs of their citizens. States that rely more on automotive transportation, for example, could use their funding to meet those needs. Meanwhile, many Americans continue to confront serious challenges with their day-to-day -day transportation, including costs that have increased dramatically in recent years. 
DOT in its current form is insufficiently equipped to address those problems. DOT's discretionary grant-making processes should be abolished, and funding should be focused on formulaic distributions to the states, which know best their transportation needs and are incentivized to think of the long-term maintenance costs. At a bare minimum, the number of grants should be consolidated. DOT would also reduce unnecessary burdens by returning to the Trump administration's rule-on-rules approach to regulations, implemented in late 2019 as RIN 2105 AE84. This rule strengthened the administration's effort to remove outdated regulations, find cost-saving reforms, and clarify that guidance documents are in fact guidance rather than mandatory impositions. The Biden administration unwisely moved away from this reform, and the next administration should revive it without delay. End hour 19 to 622.